So welcome to our last of the season, Everyone Has a Voice. Um, it's been a wonderful year. We've had many um, wonderful poets and student poets and open mic and features. Um, it's been a whirlwind. Uh, we're going to take a couple months off in July and August and come back in uh, September. But um, I am happy to say our features, Danielle Legroche Georges and Erica Moling, are here. So we're going to hear some fabulous poetry. Um, we're going to have an open mic. Um, and I just want to thank the director of the library. Paul Engel for giving us this wonderful space. Without him, uh, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be sharing our words, our poetry, um, without Paul Engel. <laughs> so we're going to have the open mic, and I'm going to um, start off the open mic and read a couple of poems. So the first poem is a new old poem. Um, meaning I just recently wrote it, but it's been in me for a long, long time. I just could never get the words out. And um, I heard um, a poem that kind of brought that out. So I've been doing uh, workshops for bereavement. And um, one of the things I noticed with all the, with all the workshops I've done is that nobody ever brought up the subject of the person who had to give that final okay to end life. Um, but, but now um, that I'm doing them, that subject is being brought up. And so this poem is about that subject, about the person who has to make that final decision. And, and it's agonizing, heartbreaking, um, every emotion you can think of. What do you want to do? The doctor faces me, the nurse by his side, to ease the query made so many times. Listening to the fog, I hear the blah, 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 shh, the white noise. In the antiseptic room where I inhale, exhale, the rush of my thoughts. Fear, feel the fear of losing control of feedback and make vocal sounds, not words. Uh-huh, uh-huh. What do you want to do? We've given you the options. Here I am with a high school education and some college. Well, a little, just to say, just enough to say some. Holding the decision of life or death. Not life and death, but life or death. Thumb up, thumb down. March is the first, first month of spring in the Northern Hemisphere. The Ides of March beware our past, though it gives way to the Lamb of Spring. What do you want to do? We've given you all the options. May is a month of spring, northern hemisphere, and autumn in the southern. I wish I may, I wish I might, have this wish I wish tonight. They'll be comfortable. We can do that. Take as long as you like. July, the warmest month, the most of the northern hemisphere, and the coldest, and much of the southern hemisphere, and named for the Roman general Julius Caesar. A2, Brutus. Would you like to speak to a chaplain, man of the cloth absorbing the news folding in the pit of my stomach? We have one on call. What do you want to do? We've given you your options. Functioning, alter consciousness. I am waiting, delaying the action, the sound, my sound, the word of my decision the inevitable morning of mortality. My name is Philip, husband of Linda, March 4th, son of Alexandra, May 11th, son of James, July 24th. 
As my hand writes this message, I hear the flatlined sound of empty. The isolation claws away at every vein and artery. November is the 11th month, brings on the reckoning of the 11th hour. Skeletons of trees bear witness hibernation. We hunker down in the dark. I look out at the darkened sky, blink and breathe, blink and breathe. My name is Philip, friend to our loyal beagle of 17 years, Lila, November 26. December is the 12th and the final month of the year. Slowly we move on to the landscape of winter. I see her perched on the windowsill where the sun shines obliquely. As the vet assures me, this is her time. My name is Philip, Bella, feline protector of the house, December 19th. I listen for the last breath. What do I do with the past? So the second poem, Um, so we have high school graduations and college graduations, and I just recently went to my 50th high school reunion. So that was kind of creepy. <laughs> A lot of orthopedic shoes. I couldn't figure that out. Anyway, so this is the day after. Um, I just want to get something here. Hopefully we can get it. Nope. All right. So, the day after high school reunion. We are in the true years of our life. Can you relive the past for one glorious night? We shed our yokes, the years of striving to be, the heaviness of the air wearing us like the weight of the world, the stories we hold within us. Our past, black and white, the shadows of grayness cover us like a blanket against the obscurities of light. What secrets bind us as we yearn nostalgic, marking off each page of the calendar, our roadmap of accomplishment, and disappointment imprinted into our stream of consciousness. We anticipate the gathering, feel the colors of the music, the lightness of dance, our bodies flowing, remembering first dance, first kiss, the touch that made us weak in the knees. We turn yesterday into today, reflections in this moment. Tomorrow, waiting to treasure remembrance. Hey, bartender, one for my good friend, make it two. We are reborn, swallowed up in the frenzy, hugs accepting firm handshakes, and the smiles with no hidden agendas. In unison, we sing for each other, to each other, the melodies of our being intertwine. We are the river flowing into the sea, sea, the ripples of each heartbeat beating as one. The ripple turns into a wave carrying us as dawn awakens, shedding its night skin, gives herself to blue warm silk. Dreams form, hands cup moments release. We transcend, contemplate, and find new meaning. Our past, how we are connected like water and earth, the whisper of the wind caresses us. One last time, we turn receptive to the delicate mist that drapes the last goodbye until you make me want to shout, kick my heels up, and that's it. <clears throat> so let's have our open mic. We are going to start off with our um, two of our Young poets, youth poets, we are extremely um, happy they're here. 
and we're going to start off with Anjali Andrade. Isn't every country Why are cookies and bacon called cookies and bacon if you cook bacon and bake cookies? You're not afraid of the dark, you're afraid of what's in the dark. Every blink is removed from your memory. Why are items that are being transported by car called shipment, but when transported by ship, it's called cargo? Ice melts in a pool of its own blood. Just looking at a dead tree and loosening it. That are not considered 24 hours. One hour you're born and the other you die. When you say forward or backward, your lips move in that direction. A mirror doesn't break, it multiplies. If you're a doctor and you go see your doctor who tells you about his, how his doctor saves his life and his doctor's doctor's doctor saves his life and that his doctor's 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 doctor saves his life, as a doctor, you made the endless doctor loop. Thanks. <laughs> So Anjali has been a veteran of the open mic. Uh, she's been here uh, almost every month, um, growing and learning and presenting her poetry. But now we have Karina Jackson, and this is her first time on the open mic. So we're very excited to hear Karina. Jackson, and I'll be reading a short poem about summer. To me, summer means sitting in the shade, using my TV, making art, mailing postcards to my friends about all the places I've been, eating barbecue, and reading books. To me, that's what I think summer means. All right, now for the grown-ups. Please welcome from Middlesex Community uh, College, Tom Laughlin. Thanks, Philip. Great to be here. Um, I uh, have always told people I'm a tree hugger. I spent a lot of time in, in the woods hiking and um, got thinking about where all that came from. And uh, this poem came out of that, uh, looking back. Uh, it's called Dendrophile, which means lover of trees. They were our jungle gyms, our hanging bars, our hobby horses, our August cooling tents, our winter snow shakers, our climbing walls, our mountaintops, our citadels. They surrounded us as we ran, chasing each other past their sappy bark, over pine needle thickened paths, the forest floor squishy with mulch, and the fibrous reaching roots of these silent sentinels standing watch over our boyhood selves as we grabbed for sticks at our feet. Broken branches weakened by boring insects, chiseled by birds bashing their hungry heads, and cracked loose by the weight of winter. Swinging and slamming these against trunks, snapping pieces that spun in the air, flying past ecstatic eyes, and nearly clipping our crew-cutted heads. And whose six-year-old challenge was it that day which set us attempting to climb pole-thin pines with their pencil-pointed stubs of branches long choked off by the thick canopy of green high above? Grabbing scratchy trunks, we stepped carefully, slowly easing our weight onto one bone-dry stub, then another, the height competition continuing until a brittle crack to suddenly drop us tumbling to pine-needled floor. Then, unthinking, my sights on bragging rights, I reached up one stubbled trunk, hugging too closely its scratchy bark as I climbed until the crack the sudden drop, the unseen sharpened stub slicing as I pole slid toward forest floor, a thin red line from my belly to chest. Afterwards, 
the stitches, the bandages, the long torso scar were show and tell exhibits until puberty and chest hair and decades erased any visible sign of that first woodland infection when sap began running through my veins. Thank you. Well, I am here in Brockton, and I had the great pleasure of teaching at Massasoit for many years. Um, and um, there was, uh, thank God it's come back just recently, um, the Pell Grants were um, reinstated now for um, inmates. But I taught in a couple of prisons through Massasoit, and um, I had the pleasure of um, teaching Thomas Kuntz, who was recently, finally, after so many years, um, is, is free and on the other side. Um, I, he has been in the news, he's been in my mind for many years, and uh, the last number of years, uh, written different prison poems and reflecting back on, on the experiences there. But um, this is uh, for Tommy, and this is uh, a villanelle. Don't write a lot of form poems, but a villanelle uh, called Prison Class. In any other culture, he'd be a prince, whispered the guest writer I'd brought to prison that night, knowing of his poor court-appointed defense. A bright high school athlete and with a mother from Port-au-Prince, he became a marine to keep college in his sights, though in any other culture, he'd be a prince. On leaving, his warning shot above the bat-waving mob was self-defense, fleeing a party detonated by a racial fight. But his was a poor court-appointed defense. Inside gray walls, a young man spoke with quiet confidence of Welty, Faulkner, Baldwin, and Updike. I felt in any other culture he'd be a prince. A trial, no ballistics that might have proved his innocence, but a white man was killed that night. A shame about the poor court-appointed defense. Decades, he's been behind walls ever since the judge gave him natural life. In another culture, he might have been a prince, but instead, he got a poor court-appointed defense. Thank you, Tom. And uh, just to let you know, Tom uh, will be back in December um, as one of our features. So we can hear a lot more from Tom. Um, again, uh, one of the grown-ups, um, John Hol Holgerson, um, is a veteran of the South Shore Poets. Um, and he's written um, a new book and we are going to um, get to listen to some of it. John Holgers. Um, I think it's quite the contrast, the two young ladies, and no offense, Tom, but the much older guys coming up to the mic. Uh, the two poems I'd like to read are actually uh, about two different houses, and the only thing the houses really share in common is that they're located on the same small Greek island, which is about 47 miles, nautical miles, southwest of Athens, and a long baseball throw off of the Peloponnese, which is the southwestern coast of Greece. Um, the island is called Hydra, and in English we would pronounce it Hydra. There is no airport on the island. The only way to get to the island is by boat. And when you're on the island, there are no cars. There are two ambulances and a very large red Toyota pickup truck that has a lot of firefighting equipment in the back of it. Outside of that, there are no vehicles on the island. They have a trash truck that comes on a scow once a week, and then they have also another boat that brings trucks to empty the sewage on another day of the week so that the trash trucks and the sewage trucks are not there at the same time. If you wish to get around the island, you must walk, or if you're very brave, ride a donkey. 
uh, let me just say that nobody outside of those who actually need the donkeys for their work uh, ride the donkeys. Tourists do. Tourists pay 20 euros to ride around on a donkey for a while. But other than that, um, these two houses on this island, one is on the east, uh, I should say, the, the way to get into the island, as I mentioned, is by boat. And entrance is into a horseshoe-shaped harbor. Um, on one side of the, on the eastern side of the harbor, there is this house in the first poem that I'm going to read, about three quarters of the way up the side of a mountain. And it looks down onto the harbor and also out to the rest of the Aegean Sea. It's called High White Stone House, and I guess you can guess that it is a High White Stone House. I don't think of you much in this High White Stone House with silence and unseen shade drawn on each unshuttered window. Outside, the buzz of flies on poppies as loud as saws on redwood. The clop of hooves on carved rock stairs as empty as the chairs in the living room. No sound replicates your laughter burning moussaka in the kitchenette or your violin serenading the gypsies on the boats in the Horseshoe Harbor. The creak of the door creeps across these walls. The breath of the wind stutters. You, standing on the terrace, turning your back, a ghost who sometimes mutters. When shutters close at day's end, a hungry dark slides over me. Inside this high white stone house, this hollow, unending echo of you. The other house is on the western side of the harbor. And it was owned and still is by his family. It was owned um, by the Canadian poet, singer, songwriter, Leonard Cohen. And for those of you who don't know Leonard Cohen's name, I'm sure you've heard what has become his most famous song, Hallelujah. A lot of people think it was written by Rufus Wainwright or John Cale, but it was Leonard Cohen. And he lived on this house, or in this house, for 10 years, almost a decade, in, in the 1960s. Um, and it's a five minute walk from one of the houses that I'm familiar with on the island. And if you go by Leonard's house at any given time, the tourists who come into the island on the boats, it's like a pilgrimage. You can see them there at the house from early in the morning to late in the evening. Some are taking pictures and some are just looking at the house because of so many things that went on there while Leonard Cohen lived there. So um, I was a frequent visitor to that house over the years and not not to see Leonard. I did meet Leonard in Boston, but I never met him on the island. Uh, but I went to his house, like many pilgrims, more for inspiration than for anything else. This poem is called Idra, April 2019, for Leonard Cohen, 1934 to 2016. I stood outside your old home today as I've done in years past. Tangled ivy vines from the roof terrace stretched down the wall toward me, a thin green leafy rope inviting me to grab its strands with both hands and pull myself up. If I was a younger man, perhaps, but my wall scaling days ceased long ago. Instead, I looked for the wire and the bird. I saw the former, a tight rope, taut and thin, pole tied between red roofed white houses. There was no sparrow but I'm still here, listening for what cannot be heard. I put my hand on the wall of your house, hoping the lingering remnant of a once strummed guitar riff or the clickety-clack of your old olive green Olivetti would course through my fingertips, run the maze of jagged lines on my smooth palm, up my willing arm to the area of the brain or whatever part of the soul sends messages to the muse assigned to a scribbler of verse. But it doesn't work that way, does it, Leonard? That singular muse here for you then isn't mine. Although I'd like to think 
They may be sisters or, more likely, cousins once or twice removed. At Duscos Taverna, I dined on Fresifius under the huge old pine tree where once upon a time, before fame and fortune fell upon you, you sat, sang, and played guitar for Mariana and all your idiot friends. I'll come by tomorrow. You never know. Someone or something may be at home. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I know the island he speaks of. Um, I've been there a couple of times. Um, my father was born on an island called Sifnos, which was built in the 14th century and basically is still the same. It does have running water and electricity, but nothing else has changed. So I ex know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, before I bring Jonathan on, uh, a couple of announcements I would like to make. Um, since we're not going to be here in July and August. July 30th, very exciting day for Brockton. We are going to induct uh, with a ceremony our first Youth Poet Laureate of Brockton. So we are very excited. Ayanna Blake. Uh, from Brockton High will be our Youth Poet Laureate. She's doing some events now, but um, officially um, on that day she will be Brockton's first Poet Laureate. And then uh, a couple of days later on Wednesday, August 3rd, I will have the honor of doing a joint reading with her right here, at, right here in, in the Driscoll Art Gallery. So that's going to be on Wednesday night, August 3rd. Um, 6.30, poet's time, which means everybody's here at 6.30, but we probably won't get started until like quarter past seven around there. <laughs> so, um, let's bring on our features, and we're going to introduce Jonathan, who is just finding out right now that at the beginning of the next season in September, he and I will be co-hosting together. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So I would like to welcome my new co-host, for everyone has a voice, Jonathan Stroud. Good afternoon, everybody. All right, so um, I'm gonna be introducing our featured poets for today. So our first featured poet is Erica Cheris Moling. She is a lesbian poet, educator, and librarian. Her writing has been published in literary journals including Crab Creek Review, Tinderbox, Redivider, Vinyl, and Entropy. Her poems have been nominated for the Pushcart Prize and published in the 2020 Orison Anthology. A Mass Cultural Council Fellow, she's an alum of the Bread Loaf Writers Conference and received her MFA in Creative Writing from Antioch University. Her chapbook, how We Burn was published in 2022 by Seven Kitchens Press as a part of the Robin Becker series. So good to be with you all today. Um, and I would also like to express my gratitude to Paul, who is an old friend and a dear friend, um, and asked me to come down and read. Um, I used to be in this area and I am no longer, so we made quite a trek, um, my wife and I, and the, uh, the little songbird in the back row is also mine. So I appreciate your patience with her. Uh, I'm gonna read you some poems today from, uh, from the chapbook, from How We Burn, um, which I wish I had copies with me today, but paper shortage being what it is, I don't actually have extra copies in my hand yet. But if you have interest, please find me afterwards and I'll let you know how to get one. Um, this is a, a semi-autobiographical collection um, about uh, coming out as a lesbian in the evangelical church uh, and um, sort of processing uh, what that meant for my faith, what that meant for the community that I had been a part of, um, and what that meant for me as a person. Um, so uh, we'll start with a prayer. 
Um, the title of the poem is When You Pray, Pray Like This, which if there are any Bible buffs in the room, um, that's, those are the words that Jesus uh, is purported to have said before reciting what we now know as the Lord's Prayer. When you pray, pray like this. Our mother, immaculate and manifest in every curve, the curse is not your name. Be gone, your anonymity, your ruin, depart. Your urge to hide your skin be undone until the sky is no longer an eye. Watch as I raise myself from this grave. Take from me this night my mortared stone, but leave me well within my boundaries. I am nothing like liable for that which stays within me, nor that which strays without me, following every pulse beyond repulsion. Receive every me with generosity against any aching that isn't the push of labor, and draw me into your shameless rest against every never, except the one I am becoming. Um, so there are a number of saints in the collection as well, which were people that um, became the, the folks that I looked to to find my way along the, along the process. Um, so this is a prayer to Saint Sylvia, um, who is actually a woman by the name of Sylvia Earle who in 17, or 1978, excuse me, um, made an open ocean dive, untethered, and set the woman diver's depth record, which still holds to this date. This is called Prayer to Saint Sylvia, as I listened to her interview while driving home from yet another failed healing. Heaven is above us, and you know what's the other way. Your friend laughed over lunch when you asked why we knew so little of the ocean and so much about the moon. You, the first to brave the beneath, your bosom locked tight in a thousand pounds of uncrushable skin, tell me how light your womanhood feels in that gym suit, standing under pressured shadow submerged in a sea 5% seen, the rest secrets. Here, not the hell we'd been taught to fear, no monsters with mouths full of queer needled teeth, nor a barren soundless rock of a dust-strewn moon. Below the blue fire pulses down giant spiraling coral stretching their necks to your touch. Fish flash like fireflies in a field full of June. Crabs hang from sea fans like shirts on a line. Heaven on earth, you call it. Reconceived, you release the cord, tying you to the familiar fathoms above. No flag to claim the unknown. And I don't know why I feel like I'm floating as your voice fills a long highway drive but a prayer bubbles up from my swimming insides. Dear saint of sinking fearless, in my deep, a frond of want unfurls down where nothing is said to survive. Mother of unearthing, help me untether. Here in the dim dashboard light, my heavy heart dives. Another figure, debatably saint, um, this is uh, to Billy Porter, who um, you may or may not have a visual memory of um, his outfit to the 91st Academy Awards, which was a beautiful ball gown uh, that was a tux on top and a, and a ball gown on the bottom. And it created a little bit of a stir. The other thing um, you should know about this poem is it is a form um, that I tweaked. Uh, the form is called a golden shovel, 
which traditionally means you take a line of a Gwendolyn Brooks poem and you run it down either the right or the left hand margin, word at a time, and then those words become the words you work from or to for the new poem. I twisted it just a little bit, um, and in this collection there are a few poems that are golden shovel-ish, where the line, instead of being Gwendolyn Brooks, is a verse taken from the Bible, either one that I found comfort in or one that was somewhat antagonistic to me in my coming out process. So the verse for this one is from the book of Esther, and it reads, who knows but that you have come to your royal role for such a time as this. To Billy Porter in his tuxedo gown for such a time as the 91st Academy Awards. Who understands how a black body floats, fashioned free? Who knows the way velvet can hold a black man that can't help but glow better than the red velvet at your feet? This carpet that knows a monarch by his bearing. How many steps did it take you to come home to this black gown and ball tie? Tonight you have a kingdom. Your power and glory shine in every fiber. Become each queer question draped in our deepest closets. Answer to no one but the black boys trembling inside them. Let them hear your voice rattle the extravagant walls of the house Hector Valley built, royal abuelo of underground ballroom. You know who you are, what role you've dressed for. You ask, what does it mean to man up for this? Man enough to wear what you were told would ruin such star-studded aspirations as yours. Which clothes make a man and which make him enslaved? The cameras flash and each time you dare them to look away. You're exposed in your radiant dark as you meet every open aperture that will hold you. We watch as this picture develops, all its possibilities forming before our eyes. <laughs> so, um, the next one is dedicated to uh, a transgender woman by the name of Sister Mary Elizabeth Clark. Uh, she was a transgender veteran and Episcopal sister who inspired by meeting an isolated young man with AIDS at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, took to the bulletin board system, the early, early internet, um, it was known as Aegis at the time and built in it a definitive accessible source of information about the disease. This is called Seven Hailed Marys. Hail the maybe six Marys, too many to keep their stories straight. Shout out the name that first and always means mother. Honor too for the harlot the wastrel of expensive perfumes, so often confused with the third from Magdala. Hail them both, their favored empty wombs, and the other Mary at the tomb. Can I get a witness for the unreliable witness Marys? Women's work to embalm, to bear bodies, but not to bear witness. Three Marys, keeping watch at the cross while another, one verse wonder, a host to a fugitive prayer group. When in Rome, Mary worked hard, but at what, we'll never know. No, not much to keep these Marys from bleeding into each other. Not much to keep them straight, except their husbands, their sons, their hard-working hands barely there bearing boys, bearing with boys, who wouldn't say, don't be a Mary, because that only means effeminate and forgettable in American slang, as in so many Marys in the morgue, it was hard to keep them straight. 
2,000 years after Christ died, a seventh Mary keeps vigil. As aides lay down Peter after Paul, and all Jesus can do is weep. Hail, transgender transgressor. Yet another no one can keep straight. Raise your shield, this aegis, in a lavish act of librarian love. This woman's work hosted on the brand new web. Honor be upon her behind the bulletin board. Her hands, the bearer of days brought back from the grave for our sons whom we'd left to die. Hail sister, we remember your Hail Mary sailing the heavens. finish with one last prayer, and then I'm going to move into some newer poems. Um, this one is also called When You Pray, Pray Like This, and it's the final poem in the book. My body, which is a queendom, humming be each bone. My craving come, every want be wooed on foot, as well as laid on my back. Spin in me this day my every cell and release my toxic as I let go of those who intoxicate me and lead me not into numbness, but marrow me from strain. For mine alone is this failing frame, its whir and its thump until my heart beats its last amen. So that's how we burn. Um, the next few poems that I'll finish with here um, are part of what seems to be a new project. There are at least a few poems here, and we'll see if they keep going. Um, my father's mother, who actually um, was just put in hospice care and is in the process of uh, leaving us. Um, but before that, we had to put her into assisted living. She was no longer able to live on her own. And we had to empty out her house that she lived in for 50 some odd years, um, which was a big process and a lot of, do you want this, do you want this? And there was, she loved to take photographs. So there were photographs, books of photographs all over the house. And a lot of them, my mother went through and, and said, okay, these are, these are of Beth and these are of Greg and, and sort of divvy them out so that everybody had their childhood pictures. But there was a box of sort of orphan pictures that didn't have anybody recognizable in them. Um, many of them were black and white. Many of them were uh, poorly labeled if labeled at all. So they were just a little bit of a, a mystery. And I, um, was looking through some of the, the pictures that my mom had found in the home and came across these. And I said, Mom, has anyone else expressed interest in these? She said, no. And I said, well, I'm going to take them because I feel like these are poems. I don't know how they're poems, but they're poems. Um, so I'm going to take them for now. And if somebody else wants them later, <laughs> you can have them after I'm finished poeming them. Uh, poeming them. Um, so these are all poems that come from those photographs, some of which have stories behind them, some of which um, I'm just sort of reading what I can into what I, what I can see. Um, they're all um, from the main area, and most of them are from the 1940s, 1950s. Um, and the title of each poem is just whatever was written on the back of the photo. So this is Dead Water. Another view of water, stone, and trees. Wet and simmering in the swollen stream, black rocks rise from the surface like a braille my illiterate hand can't make meaning from. This picture is clearer. The focus is sharp, but the context is still a blur. On the back, the looping graphite of my Grammy's hand tells me only dead water. Like a fish caught by an invisible line, the E in dead with its too long bar turned tail, vowel twisted skyward. It doesn't struggle. 
Somewhere in my Grammy's mind, there might be a memory dangling from an iridescent nylon thread hooked to some younger summer when she still wanted to live. Outside, the September air is crisp, a reminder that this summer too will pass. So much I wish I could ask before winter, but the silence hangs on the phone line when I call her and the dead air between us doesn't struggle anymore. Sometimes when I listen to our breathing, I can hear the rush of water, the locked language of stone. Fish Hatchery, Dead River, 1949. Somewhere out of sight, some wiggling thing is working its way into the world, fighting for food or hiding in gravel. Tiny trout, trying to beat the odds in tanks tucked behind the photo's little white house, or maybe inside the long shaped, barn-shaped building in front of it. At the top of the road that runs along both buildings, a stream winding its way on the other side through the center of the frame, and a white dress facing away from me in the foreground, her arms supporting another wiggling thing. Tiny toddler, trying to work out the words for all he sees in the face that's hidden from me. Beside his grainy image, I hold the profile of my 27-week ultrasound, my tiny wiggling thing, comparing the black and white contours of noses and chins. The resemblance swims in and out of view, darting out of sight the harder I stare. What would the woman, his mother, his aunt, say to me, lesbian mom carrying my little science miracle? If she turned to look at my face, would she recognize me as family or freak? So many spawning questions in the churning tanks of my mind, while down in my belly, I feel the wheeling motions of a child already learning to swim upstream. Uh, I think this one will be my last. I haven't been keeping track of time, but we'll, we'll call this one the last one for now. This is Cathedral Pines Flagstaff. And the only additional piece of information that I should give you is that Flagstaff used to be a small town in Maine, and it is now a lake. Cathedral Pines Flagstaff. Which bird is bishop of this vaulted forest? Whose hand that serves as priest the picnic table pews cleaned of their sacramental stains, barrels emptied regularly of their pungent sins. The piney spires stretch up and out through the top of the picture, and somewhere off the edge of this view, water, enough to christen a whole town in the proper Baptist fashion. The hydroelectric god hasn't flooded this scene with its damning need. The family of four exiting their car, looking up each timber tower, doesn't measure in cubits their odds of survival or the arc of their, pace, their place in this flagging history. No, they're here to take in the incense of pine in the summer air, a prayer wafting through the blessed beams that still seem wholly evergreen for now. All right, and uh, our other feature poet is Danielle Ligros Georges, and she's the author of several books of poetry, including the most recent, Island Heart, Translations of the poems of Haitian French writer Ida Faubert. Ligros Georges is a professor of creative writing at Lesley University in the former Boston Poet Laureate, serving in the role between 2015 and 2019. For more information, visit daniellegrosgeorges.com.
you, Jonathan, and thank you, Phil, for organizing uh, this reading series. I'm very happy to be with you all this afternoon, especially on such a beautiful day. This is our competition, so <laughs> thank you, audience, for being here uh, this afternoon. Um, and I'm very happy to be following Erica, whose poems are very beautiful, and the open mic people, and young people, too. Um, very inspired by your work. Uh, okay, I'm going to start with a poem from Maroon, Songs for Women. I will there be no women here who would circle red-dressed, ruby-hearted, glass-cut, if there be flowers, then the bloom of cyclamen on in greens glowing, night phase, night shade, wild in wind. Sin be the will to descend, humming bird still, steal the fire's sound, take note and return it. Let song be the skin of a glimmering, unsettled, raising, belly deep in the strike of match and band. Be the belly, the pepper pot. Come close just to drop it. Slide until the notes are a scaffold, ash flicked, unphoenixed. Given the news that came down yesterday from the Capitol, um, the very disturbing news in my opinion, I thought I would, uh, in my reading today, um, present poems that uh, take up the lives and experiences of women. Uh, and that celebrate women and femmes. And so I be, I, I'm going to read a poem about my grandmother. I, uh, I'm Haitian, and um, grew, I grew up in Mattapan, um, Boston. And um, my, when I was a, you know, a, a kid, uh, my grandmother would take us to this open air market uh, called Hay Market in Boston, because I think it reminded her of open air markets in Port-au-Prince. And we would get our vegetables and our, you know, other things and, uh, and, of, and our poultry live, right, chickens. So my grandmother would procure a chicken, which she would stuff into a pillowcase, and then we would take the red line back oh. home. And I was trying to be cool, you know. <laughs> My grandmother's got a chicken in a pillowcase on the red line. So, okay, that's the introduction. To <laughs> that's, that is the introduction to this poem, Boston Backyard. The image of the headless hen depends on the ring. The ring. My grandmother puts her hands on the thing is ginger. A simple dust rises from the yard. We had been playing too long inside and escaped to the porch. She had not meant us to see the white feathers pinking, the twisting this way and that of the run, the tree as it threatened the bird my grandmother wipes her hands on her apron, which is blue with white buttons, and touches the dust to pick up the hen. She speaks but two words, which are soft, to the bird and to the wind. She sends one word of thanks. Uh, 
Uh, we're familiar with the muses. John had a poem uh, about the muses, the, the nine daughters of Nemesine and Zeus in, in Greek mythology. And so the job of the muses is to run around and inspire people, John included, <laughs> and others. Then I thought, well, don't the muses get tired, John? Don't they? <laughs> Musing. The muse licks her own tongue, pens rhymes for her own pleasure, dips her quill, mind stick in dark ink of her skin and sits at a large bureau thinking. This poem is um, about, okay, well, not that poem. You're reading my, now I'm, I'm, I'm uh, thinking aloud, okay. This is called How to Kiss. And uh, again, uh, one that comes out of my Haitian background, uh, we Haitians have this really terrible habit of kissing people when we encounter them. A kiss on each cheek. Um, or, or sometimes four kisses, if like from the, the, sh the valley of the shadow of death you come, you see coming towards you, your twin from whom you'd been separated at birth, you might give them four kisses. And so Haitian kids grow up having to kiss all the adults who come over to visit. So they call you into the living room and you've got to, you know, for parties, kiss uncle so-and-so and aunt so-and-so and so-and-so. Okay. So this is how to kiss. The children know how to kiss, to descend stairwells when called into rooms of colored lips, whispered entendres, demure smiles, the uncle who en creole calls us cochon wild pigs. We walk into crooned como vatus, rolling too long from gold-filled mouths Thistly jowls, we kiss the cheek, the next cheek, and more cheeks, the odors of vitalis, the smart man's hair tonic, of Ben Champagne, Chanel number no. five, eau de Floride, of various adult O's. We bristle in advance against the teenager whose five o'clock shadow goes from sun yard to sit in parlors, his knees eclipsed in cloth a foreshadow that we too would be the kissed. But Pascal had the audacity once to alter form, opening her mouth to snake a tongue that swept beige powder from the face of Madame. Alta grasse la vache, exposing a patch of brown from chin to ear. A véritable scandale. Tongue on cheek. Truth in deed. The wild pigs. I, uh, I have translated the poems of the Haitian French uh, poet Ida Faubert, who was writing in the early part of the 20th century. And um, I, uh, I really love her poems, and I, I, I like her very much. Um, she, she's no longer alive. She uh, died in 1969. She wrote really wonderful um, uh, poems in, in form. She was a master of, of uh, form, and uh, she also led this very interesting life. She grew up in 
She was born in Haiti in Port-au-Prince, but she grew up in Paris and moved back and forth and took part uh, of the literary scenes, took part in the literary scenes in both those countries. Um, and so I will read to you um, a poem called Tropical Night, uh, my translation. I'll read to you her first stanza, Soir Tropical in French, so you hear the nice rhythm and meter, the rhythm, the sound, the rhyme, and then I'll read to you my uh, translation of the entire poem. Soir Tropical. Le soir est lumineux, le soir est tendre et beau, le soleil s'est éteinte, la lune est sur les roses, une langueur pénètre au cœur même des choses, et les grands palmiers noirs rêvent au bord de l'eau. Tropical night. The night is luminous. The night is tender and beautiful. The sun has obscured itself. The moon rests on the roses. A languor enters the very heart of things, and the tall black palms dream at the water's edge. The jasmine have mixed their star-studded branches with lianas in bloom. Summer's breath caresses the heavy fruit. The dense sensuality lets its long veil linger along the sinuous paths. Over there, on the way, not a song, not a sound. Nothing disturbs the peace of a joy we listen to. Come, take in the fragrances at the road's edge and breathe in my soul, spread across the night. And another Ida Faubert poem uh, entitled Wait My Love, Mon Amour Attendez. She's a, Faubert is a great writer of love poems, um, some about the beauty of love and some about the badness of love. <laughs> Wait, my love. When you forget that you held me captive in your arms like a thing that was yours, when you grow tired of my sweet love, wait until night falls to tell me. Then you won't see my undone face, my sorry eyes, my trembling mouth. The dark will veil my crushing sorrow. Wait until night falls completely. Wait until the wind makes the trees wail and the birds of the woods weep in their nests, then you won't hear my sobs or the cry of my heart colder than marble. Wait until thunder darkens the skies and it pours nearby on the road. In the sad night, you'll mistake, no doubt, the tears in my eyes with the tears of the sky. One day, you'll forget that you held me captive in your arms like a thing that was yours. So to tell me this, have the sweetest words. Wait, my love, until night falls. <laughs> Ida Faubert. And um, the last poem, the, the last Ida Faubert poem I will read is, uh, I guess, another bad love poem. Let's see, where is this bad love poem? Faubert is said to have loved both men and women. So I think she could be called queer in today's parlance, although she, uh, living in the early part of the 20th century, didn't use that word. Okay. Rondel, uh, and a rondel is a type of form, and so you'll hear some repeating lines. This is a rondel to Mrs. Uh, 
R.G. With your bewitching eyes, whose dark beauty haunts us, with the seductive grace of the most charming fowler, you're like the lovely buds of the enchanting blue countries with your bewitching eyes, whose dark beauty haunts us. To ease all pains, your voice is lulling, and one thinks you care, but you cause such grief with your bewitching eyes. So I don't think it went well with Mrs. R.G. and Ida Flaubert, but I love these poems, and uh, I have copies of this book in case you would like uh, a copy at the end of the read. All right. Um, let's see. I think I'll read uh, two more poems. And uh, this is a poem from the real world. Uh, I, I, in, um, in my poems, uh, in some of my poems, I take up uh, uh, racism. So this is a poem about racism. Poem from the real world. I'm on Dorchester Ave when I hear it. Nigger. Oh. Um, uh, trigger warning, I should have said, before the poem. So I, I use this word. So forgive me for not mentioning that earlier. I'm on Dorchester Ave when I hear it, nigger. It is September 28th, 2004, and I haven't heard the word used this way in so long. I'm for some seconds stunned and simultaneously, simultaneously amused in the way an archeologist might be, coming upon the grotto of some long extinct tribe she's been studying for years to discover their swear words etched in the cave. And almost in the same moment, I say to myself, he's not talking to me, and keep walking. It's a temperate, lovely day, Indian summer. Indian summer asterisked for further study. Blustery, and again it comes, nigger. And nigger comes creeping, creeping from its coffin, fettered, measured, lynched, raped, reconstructed, redlined, incarcerated, deconstructed, resurrected. I would have preferred negress, more charming and bellatristic, more gendered, past the purpose and grasp of the wielder of nigger. But I digress and return to the task of the inscription with what is available to me, that is language. There is no poetry here because there is no poetry here. I'm recording this to remind myself this wasn't an odd dream, the result of having watched one too many PBS documentaries on civil rights and race relations in the United States, of imagining a young Linda Brown crossing the train switchyard to school, Topeka, Kansas, 1952. I am recording this to remind myself that this did indeed happen on September 28th, 2004, in my beloved Boston, Massachusetts, the United States of America. And I'll end with a short poem entitled, Only. Nature hides the most beautiful design, the norm, the anomaly, the rare, the rarest, which is to say, the only. And aren't we each, each twin even, only? Thank you. 
So we come to a close of 2021, 2022. Um, I do have a couple of thank yous. Um, Brockton Community Access, Tom, um, who records, edits all our readings. He has been here for every reading, recording and editing the pro product, getting it on uh, Brockton Community Access and then to YouTube. Um, he's been um, to Voices of Diversity, our annual event where we have 10 poets um, speaking or presenting their poems and their um, heritage and then translating into English. Um, he's been to that. We did our educators event um, where we had teachers who write poetry, not, not poets who are teachers, but teachers who write poetry. We invited them um, and they came and shared their poetry. It was an amazing day. Um, we had teachers and professors from Brockton High and Cardinal Spellman, um, Bridgewater State, um, New Heights, um, and it was a, a great day where they just shared their poetry. Um, so I want to thank Tom and Brockton Community Access uh, for doing all that. Of course, we have to thank Paul Engel and the Brockton Library again for giving us this wonderful space. Um, the poets that we had uh, through the year. Um, so I want to give you a preview of who's coming in our next season. So we have in uh, September Paul Richmond, who was the National Beat Poetry from uh, Poet from uh, 2019 to 2020, and Featuring with um, Paul will be Meredith Nussbaum, who was a teacher from Brockton High. Um, October, we have Ayanna Blake, who was our Youth Poet Laureate, and um, Hannah Baptiste. I hate to, I can't, I'm trying to figure out how to say runner-up or second. There's no good way to say it. Um, she competed with um, Ayanna, and Ayanna was chosen by a whisker I, believe me, a whisker over Heather, but they will be um, featuring both of them. November, we have Reggie uh, Gibson. He'll be here. Um, December is uh, Tom Laughlin, who you heard today, and uh, Marie Gauthier. So we have two former Brocktonians coming back home. So that's going to be very cool. In January, we have Marlon Carey and Amelia Engel. So, let us thank our people on the open mic, our young poets. <laughs> and our grown-up poets. <laughs> what a way to end the year um, with a crescendo. Um, Daniel Legros Georges and Erica Molina. So, um, as I said, July 30th, we will be um, the induction ceremony for our first Youth Poet Laureate will be at the East Side Library. Um, it's going to be really wonderful because it's going to be an outdoor event. I think it's so cool. So it will be outdoors, um, and she will be inducted as the first Youth Poet Laureate. And we will be back in September. So thank you very much. Enjoy the summer. and. Let's get the word out. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jonathan Stroud, and I am the head of adult services. And this is one of our featured poets, Erica. Hello. So, uh, Erica, uh, I have a few questions for you today. Yes. And uh, I just want to start off. Uh, loved, uh, loved your poetry today and your work. Thank you. And uh, just as you were going, like, uh, just, uh, just your format was, I, I loved it. Just. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, when you use Fire of the Lord's Prayer and uh, also uh, when you were using uh, a scripture from the book of Esther, it was like mm -hmm. one of my favorite scriptures. Uh, when you spoke and you were like, uh, and it was like a, a time such as this. Mm -hmm. So one of my first question for you is, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I was thinking about this um, actually through the lens of my little daughter who is here today. She's just about six months. And no words yet, but just experimenting with sound. Um, and I have this very vivid memory of being in the grocery store with my mom. And one of my very first words was, hi. And I would use it on everyone in the store. Made it impossible for my mother to shop. But I remember sort of the rush of realizing that with that one little syllable, I could make somebody's head turn toward me. I mean, it's incredible power, right? One little syllable and I would have their attention. And I could coo and smile and do whatever I wanted to do. Um, but I, so I think very early on, I realized that, that these little syllables that we speak um, can carry great power. Um, and then growing up, I, um, I was a music student. I, um, I started playing piano in second grade. Um, I actually did my undergrad in college in classical vocal performance. Um, so it was very musical and I think I was always very in tune with the sound as much as the meaning of language. Um, so when you heard the, the Lord's Prayer poem, you were hearing the rhythm because that, that prayer has a very distinctive rhythm to it. And so when I wrote my version of it, I preserved that rhythm because it seemed to me very important as much a part of the prayer as the words were. So, yeah. All right. So we were going, how long did it actually take you to start sharing your poetry? I started sort of sheepishly sharing my poetry in middle school. It was uh, your usual angsty teenage poetry. Um, and I was very selective about who I shared it with because I was still very self-conscious about it. But um, by the time I got into high school, I was sharing it more um, with more courage, I guess I would say. Uh, and actually became my senior class high school poet laureate, um, which I didn't realize was uh, a rare thing at the time, but it was a working laureateship. So I had to write a new poem for every issue of the school newspaper. I had to do three community readings, and I had to write an original poem for graduation and read it at graduation. Um, and it, so that was really the moment where whatever vestiges of bashfulness I had sort of had to be stripped away because it really was a rather big stage for, for a high schooler. Um, so that was really the moment when I started to, to share more publicly. So from you being your high school poet laureate, how do you think you've evolved as a writer over the years? Mm -hmm. uh, I, so I referenced going to, to college for music. Um, at that point I became very focused in music and the poetry went quiet for a while because I was very, very focused on that one thing. Um, and it wasn't until many years later, um, I was working at the Berkeley College of Music as their librarian um, and one of the perks of working there was I got a free class a semester. And so I could have taken music classes, but what I did instead was I took every poetry course they offered. Um, and I really, it, it was really broad. I mean, I was taking sonnet writing classes. I was taking slam poetry classes. Anything they had, I would take. Um, and so I think in my poetry now, you can sort of hear all of those different influences, I hope. Um, you can sort of hear the slam poet uh, in the sort of plain language that I use. I never want somebody to read a poem of mine and not know what's going on, you know? Right. Um, but there's also a lot of form in my poetry. I did a golden shovel today. There's a lot of poems in that book that, that are in a particular form as well. So I've kind of got a foot in each. Um, and I think the other thing that's sort of evolved is the subject matter. I think like as a young poet, I thought every poem had to be about something deep, right? 
And I think what I've discovered is that the deep is all around us. You know, I can take a simple photograph, a simple black and white photograph, and as long as I'm sitting with it and being present with it and being honest with my reactions to it, that's deep enough. You don't have to try to make the poem deep. So. All right. Uh, so just to build off of like, a, when I was listening today, uh, I saw like how you uh, were talking about some of the pictures from your grandmother. Yeah. And one of my questions is, what are some of the influences that inspire you as an individual? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, I do read a lot of poetry, so I'm inspired by um, modern poets. Actually, it was so beautiful to read with Danielle because her work is, is very inspiring to me. It was just telling her how much uh, respect I had for her translation work. Haitian Creole is not an easy thing to translate from. Um, so I'm inspired a lot by, by uh, the current poets who are writing. But like I said, I mean, inspiration is kind of everywhere once you start to look for it. Um, you just kind of have to keep your antenna up. Um, and so when I came across those pictures, like I said, I, I said my, to my mother, those, those are poems. I don't know how they're poems. I have to take them home and figure this out. Um, but those are poems. Um, and I feel like once you're sort of looking at the world that way, the poems just sort of find you. Um, they, they, they come knocking if you're, if you're looking for them. So, with the evolution of social media, how has this platform affected your writing process? And is it for the better, or is it a determinant? Mm. I think the answer to that is yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I think one of the ways it can be a detriment is it will always be easier for me to tweet or make a post than it will be to write a poem. Um, and so it can be this sort of place that I put my time and my language because it's easy um, instead of taking that time and that language into something harder but more rewarding. Um, so to that end, it can be a little bit of a detriment um, because it takes my attention and focus. Um, but it's such an incredible networking tool. Um, and I have met so many poets through Twitter and through Facebook um, that I, I never would have met or become friends with um, another way. I encounter new poets all the time. I find their work um, through these platforms. So I think, uh, you know, as much as I don't want to be somebody who's sitting there scrolling for three hours every day. Um, it really does give us the opportunity, if we if we um, use it as such, uh, to really um, to use that web, to use that internet, uh, to connect um, in really beautiful ways. And that inspiration can find us through those platforms as well. All right. <clears throat> So uh, <clears throat> as you were reading your work um, today, um, I heard your daughter and she was adding <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> to your work. And yeah. I know she was enjoying it also. So if you could pass along your advice for poets or anyone considering the arts, what would it be? So my, my little girl watches the world with an incredible intensity. We took her to the beach for the first time, and we were taking pictures, and we wanted her to look at the camera, and she could not take her eyes off of the waves, that movement, right? It's kind of magical to watch her discover the world and remember, oh yeah, waves are kind of crazy, <laughs> right? Yes. Like, that's kind of nuts. And the fact that the moon is doing that, like, if I had to explain it to her, like, that's also kind of nuts. Um, so. Whatever way you can get in touch with that, that sort of seeing beyond seeing. You know, you look at, at a tree and you, your brain says, oh, tree. 
but stop and say, if I didn't know that was a tree, if I was encountering this for the first time, how would I describe this to somebody? What would I think it was, <laughs> right? Um, I think our job as poets is to sort of take the familiar and make people look at it again. Take that picture of Billy Porter in his gown and make people look at it again as Esther, right? To, to take the things that we sort of take for granted and say, no, wait, 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 really look at that. Do you see how special that is? Um, so in whatever way you can hold on to that, don't lose that because no matter whether you're writing or not writing, I said, you know, I've gone through periods where I, I wasn't writing any poems, but I was still a poet because I was still looking at the world as a poet. I was still watching the water move and thinking, wow, look at that. And as long as you can hold on to that, you're an artist, whether you're creating or not, and then eventually it'll become something if you can, if you can hold on to that sense of wonder and, and curiosity. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Stroud, and I'm the head of adult services. And uh, this is our featured uh, poet, Danielle. So, Danielle, as you were doing your poetry today, like, um, I loved how, like, um, you, you spoke in um, different languages. I'm like, uh, uh, for, for college and for high school, I took different languages, and I'm just like, I just loved how you just, you just used language, and just, you showed how powerful it could be. My first question for you today is, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Hmm. Yeah. I um, had an experience as a grammar school student in which uh, one of my teachers had us writing essays about our heroes. And I had read a book by Anne Petrie on Harriet Tubman and written an essay. That was the assignment that our teacher had given us, little second graders, um, and submitted it to the, the teacher. And unbeknownst to us, our teacher had submitted our essays to a writing contest. And my essay won the contest. So it was a great surprise to me, one, that, um, that the teacher had done this, and two, that my essay uh, on my hero had won and was being celebrated in my school. <laughs> so it made me understand that my words could have value and meaning in the broader world outside of the classroom, outside of my second grade classroom. So, how long did it actually take you to start sharing your poetry? Hmm, that's a good question. I think I didn't start sharing my poetry until I was in college and after college. I had written poems as a high schooler and for college classes, but I don't think I started sharing it with people until a little, you know, toward the end of my college days and then as a young adult. All right. So uh, for me, I'm a firm believer that anything that isn't growing is dead. So how do you think you've evolved as a writer over the years? That's a good question. Uh, I think my questions have changed. I think that's part of uh, evolution, that uh, we answer some questions and then we move on to new questions. And I think, for me, for the writing has always been about the question as opposed to, to the answer, right? So the question guides my writing. So the questions have changed. Um, when I was a younger person, I had questions having to do with identity, 
navigating two cultures, Haitian culture and uh, U.S. culture. And uh, so those really uh, fueled my, my work. And uh, I also think that each book uh, of poetry that I've, uh, you know, I've written teaches me something about making a book, so, uh, and um, I'm a translator as well, so I just completed a first book of, po of uh, poetic translations, and I learned so much, so I would, I, I'm going to, I'm doing something very different with the second book of translations that I'm, uh, I'm making. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more free with the first book, I stay very close to the text. And now I, I feel like I can leap a little bit more. Um, so I think those are some examples of how I have uh, evolved uh, as, a, as a writer. All right. So for me, um, I believe that influences are important. And um, as you were reading today, um, one of the poets that you um, used was Ida Faubert. Faubert. Yes. And as you were reading, I could just see the passion of like how Ida just like I could just see it on her face, how like she spoke to you. So could you tell us some of the influences that inspire you as an individual? Yeah. I think among my greatest influences have been um, black American poets, black American music, um, my experience growing up in the Catholic Church, in which uh, there were all kinds of art forms presented, not necessarily as art, but as part of a religious, uh, spiritual um, experience. So uh, for me, the Catholic Masses were full of high drama, theater, <laughs> um, great song, um, iconography. Uh, so, um, so in addition to literature, just other forms of art, um, music, a uh, big one, as I mentioned. Uh, and then, you know, there are particular poets, of course. Uh, uh, and the list is really too long to mention. But, uh, and then, um, I think, you know, the, the, the world is, is a kind of a, you know, I'm influenced by what's taking place in the world. Um, all right. So with the evolution of social media, how has this platform affected your writing process? And is it for the better or is it a detriment? Hmm. I can't say that social media has greatly affected my writing, or at least I don't think it has. <laughs> I don't know whether it has or not. But, uh, you know, with social media, you know, one can, you know, move very quickly, uh, sort of in the virtual world, one moves very quickly. Um, and I think there's less of, uh, uh, there's less linearity in thought, right, um, in, than in, say, traditional texts like novels or you know, reports. Uh, you can jump from, a and then be inspired to think about something else and you ju can jump very quickly to it so um, but I also think that that kind of leaping is not um, foreign to poetic thought so I, 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 I can't say that I think social media has affected the way I write um, yeah so, um, Jenny, everyone has a voice. We usually have a student poet, and uh, today we had some youth poets, how we usually do too. And Danielle, if you could pass along your advice for poets or anyone considering the arts, what would it be? Well, I'll say first that the two youth poets who are here this afternoon were utterly inspiring to me. So I would say to them to keep doing what they're doing. Clearly, you know, they are writing. They must be having like 
good support around their writing. They were confident. Uh, so it was a, just a, a pleasure to, to hear them read their poems. I would say to, uh, to read uh, a great deal and read widely across time, across traditions, um, to, to write and to understand that, uh, that writing, that, that one can be experimental, that just because you put it down doesn't mean that you can't change it, right? So to, to think about revision, uh, that's really important. So reading, um, thinking expansively, traveling to the degree that you can so that you have experiences to write about. And that doesn't mean that you, you, know, you need to travel to Ghana or to travel to France or um, you know, Belarus. You can travel to the next town over, um, safely of course, you know, taking, taking a bus or taking the subway or traveling to a part of a, your neighborhood that you've never visited before, right? So I think uh, reading, travel, engaging the world. And engaging the world can be done also through books. So back to that point of, of reading. All right. Thank you, Danielle.